OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Netta Anasari. I'm Technology Projects Coordinator for OTAN. Um, we are so happy um, that you can join us for today's webinar. We are here with Joe Marquez, the Director of Academic Innovation at Q, and he will be uh, doing the webinar, AI Prompt Mastery, How to Become a Prompt Genius. And so we all know out there, uh, many of us are using those AI tools and we need some help on what do we, how do we ask um, those uh, tools? How do we work effectively with the new AI tools? We have the best person to give that webinar today. So I'm gonna hand it over to Joe. Thank you, Joe, for joining us. If you don't mind introducing yourself. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Joe Marquez. I am Director of Academic Innovation for Q, and I'm so excited to be able to speak with you today because uh, generative AI tools uh, have seemingly came out of nowhere back in November 29th of 2023, uh, 22, and have taken over industry, businesses, and they will be flowing into education in the K-12 space, in the higher ed space, and in the adult ed space. And one of the things that I talk to educators about all the time is if we don't talk to students, uh, it doesn't matter what age, uh, emerging students, emerging learners, K-12, high school, college, adult ed, if we don't talk to them about these tools, they're going to use them and they're going to abuse them, right? Because they're, they're not going to know how to use them. And it's up to us to guide them in a proper way. And it's not just willy nilly typing things in and hoping you get something out. There's actually a process to it that I'm going to showcase for you as well. Um, and I, I do want you to know, if you ever, if you ever hear me use the word pedagogy, please uh, flip it to Andrew Gaji because you know I I do come from the K12 space and I do know there's a lot of adult educated adult learners in here um uh, teachers of adult learners and that's Andrew Gaji I'm I'm not talking down to you if I use pedagogy please just know I'm talking about a shift in how we approach um, our uh teaching and learning with these new tools um so uh, and 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 there there is a chance in here for you to ask questions along the way also so please feel free uh, as I'm talking, to ask your questions. If I miss it, uh, Netta is going to uh, uh, be able to, you know, let me know that I missed a really good question, and I, sh I should be able to stop and answer it. Uh, but please know that at any moment you can ask that question. Also, uh, I have a Padlet in here that uh, has every piece of resource that I'm going to be sharing with you. It has the slide deck in it. It has my contact information in it, and it has every single article that I've read, which I've added information from into my presentations. And the question I always get is, Joe, did you make this presentation or did AI make this presentation? I made this presentation. I love making presentations. And so I don't want AI to make my presentations. Uh, and that's the thing that we need to understand as well, is AI is going to be able to do a lot of stuff. If there's things that AI can do that you love doing, don't let AI do it. You do it. Uh, you get to decide how much or how little you get to utilize these tools. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that we can definitely get started. Here we go. Sharing that screen for you right here. Excellent. There we are. Um, and so we're going to look at how to become a prompt genius. And all that means is how can we talk to these tools and get the most out of them? There isn't really going to be a situation where you prompt these tools and you're going to get a 100% usable piece of information. You maybe get about 70%, maybe 80%. If you're really good at prompting, maybe 90%. But you always need to look at what you get out of it, comb through it, make sure there's no hallucinations. Uh, that's the term we use when these tools make things up. We call them hallucinations. Um, so uh, make making sure that we are uh, going through and looking at that draft, making changes to that draft before we do anything with them. That is absolutely key in all of this. Uh, again, I did already place this Padlet here into our channel. If you miss it or you need it again, we'll definitely post it in again for you as we are going through our session 
today. Uh, and again, feel free to ask questions in the chat as we are going through this learning period today. Uh, the biggest thing on this page is my email. That email is in the Padlet, uh, but uh, it's also there. You have complete access to me after today. If you have any follow-up questions you have for myself, uh, you have an idea of how you'd like to use this but don't know where to start, please, please know that you can contact me and we can have those conversations via email. If we both have time, we can have those conversations via Zoom. Uh, but know that you do have access to me to ask those kinds of of questions even after we are done for the day. All right, moving on forward. Uh, also, I am the director of Q and we do have some really great conferences. So some shameless plugs. If you are in the Northern California area, we are having a fantastic conference called Fall Q up at Teachers College of San Joaquin uh, in Stockton, California. And that's going to be October 21st and 22nd. Everybody says, okay, Fall Q is great, but what about Spring Q? We all want to go to Palm Springs. That's happening March 21st to 23rd. Uh, and we are looking for uh, a lot more higher uh, adult education appearances and presentations. Uh, so uh, know that we are trying to meet those needs as we grow into all the education spaces. And Q is a membership organization. Um, this presentation, I have been evolving since January, uh, and all Q members get free access to these. Uh, there's no cost to them. I do them once a month with all the new updates, and they're 100% free for Q members, and we usually charge like $20 if you're a non-Q member. Q membership is 40 bucks, so you go to two of these, you kind of make your money back. So uh, be, being a Q member has uh, helped me become a better educator, and so that as, as in this role, I want to help other educators be the best educator they can could possibly be and i always say the first step towards doing that is becoming a q member today all right so here we go yes all of these slides are on the padlet uh and and um available for you to take a look at and peruse at your will after this uh but i want us to take a moment and just understand the moment that we are in we are in a moment that used to only be science fiction we are in a moment where we can actually ask a question or have a conversation with the machine and it will respond back to us in a convincing linguistical way. It will respond nearly identically to how a human would respond. Uh, and it, it does a very good job at it. It is changing the way that we communicate and ask these machines to do things for us. Um, that's why we are now in, as Thomas L. Friedman mark, uh, remarks, uh, we're in a Promethean moment. Promethean moments are moments in human history where something is discovered or invented that changes the way we think about not just one thing, but everything. Changes the way we do things, not just one thing, but everything. How we communicate, collaborate, disseminate, create. This is one of those moments. Uh, there's been a lot of Promethean moments over history, which which takes a large gap in humanity and brings it closer together, uh, you know, like telecommunications, right? The telegram, the uh, telephone, the television, uh, not the Teletubbies. We want to forget about those guys. But these are all Promethean moments that we've been around in. Uh, the latest Promethean moment, I would say, that has bridged the gap of creativity, communication, and humanity is the internet. But we have to remember the internet was created in the 80s. Um, it started to really uh, uh, gain steam in the 90s, uh, but you know that is in the 90s, you still had to dial up the internet, and occasionally it was busy. I mean, you tried telling that to kids today, that, that you tried to dial up the internet and you were put on hold, right? That was the world we lived in in the, in the 90s. Um, and then in the early 2000s, once the infrastructure started to get faster and uh, DSL and cable modem started coming into play, we started getting really fast ways of communicating and collaborating um, in the early 2000s. Um, I blame Napster for that because so many college kids got into the internet for trading music. Uh, and then in the K-12 space and in the college space, 
Uh, it wasn't until like E-Rate came out where we started to really seeing infrastructure getting shored up and more devices being able to be deployed on college campuses and other campuses. Uh, and now it seems like everybody has a device, but it took a long time. This moment that we are living in, it seemed like it came out of nowhere. Unless you love reading scholarly articles, uh, you may not have known that this is where we were going since 2014. Um, but this, when it dropped November 29th, 2022, it was instantly accepted because everybody had the device to use it. Everybody had the infrastructure to use it. And you didn't necessarily need too much skill to use it. It is the fastest adopted tool in the history of the internet. So we are living in a moment that is uh, just moving forward, barreling ahead, and we have to be able to take hold of it. We have to be able to control it. And that's why when we're looking at these things, we truly have to understand the difference between a disruptive technology and the discovery of a technology. Too many times I hear people going around saying, we have to disrupt education. We have to change the way we do things. We have to start a revolution. But that, that, is, that is something that, that's, that's bullish. That is something that is, you're trying to push your way forward. We're looking for discovery. How can we discover as educators, how can we discover how this tool can help the creation of new lessons that can help differentiate instruction for our students to help our students who may not understand the material to utilize these tools as a tutor to help gain the understanding of their subject and topic uh, through the means of these devices. And the only way to do that is by discovering it. So understand the difference between disruption and discovery is a disruption is when we keep our heads in the sand and we get shocked when something comes our way and disrupts the way we teach. Discovery is when we see it coming and instead of running, we run towards it to discover what it's all about. That's what we're doing today. We are discoverers in this journey and you should be empowered by that. And you will never be disrupted when you are a discoverer in this journey. So what is generative AI? Um, you hear the buzzword chat GPT being thrown around everywhere. That is just one tool in a vast amount of tools that are out there. Generative AI uh, is any tool that uses an LLM, that stands for large language model, uh, to allow a user to put in an ask or a prompt and then receive an original output. Uh, and that could be text-based, that can be image-based, that can be audio-based, uh, and pretty soon it can be video-based. Uh, imagine being able to watch a 20-minute TV program just by you asking this machine to make one for you without any actors or anything. Crazy. That's why the Actors and the Writers Guild went on strike to ensure that that doesn't happen, right? But it it, it, it that would seem so far-fetched about two years ago that we wouldn't even think that was possible. But now there's programs out there that can create five-second clips of whatever you want. Now, five seconds is vastly off from 20 minutes, but we are at the precipice of this. We're only at the tip of the iceberg in finding out the power of these tools. Um, today, we're only going to be looking at the um, generative AI text generators. That's what we're going to be looking at. Maybe if you are enjoying this and you want to dive into some image generators, we can have another session. Maybe Netta can set that up. But today we're only going to be focusing on textual output from these tools. And the tools that we're going to be focusing on are like ChatGPT, Bard, and another one called Claude. Dot AI. I'm going to tell you what each one does. I'm going to give you a quick example of them. Uh, but I want you to kind of choose your favorite for today. Um, a lot of people choose OpenAI, uh, or which is ChatGPT. But then I see a lot of individuals uh, going going towards uh, Claude as well. And I'll show you the, the benefits of both. But before we get started, you have to know how these tools work. You have to know what is going on over this before we even get started, okay? So um, this 
is what is called a, uh, a deep learning neural network. It was built, modeled off of the neural networks of our brains on how we take external inputs, external outputs, uh, you know, from our, from our senses, our auditorial, our visual, um, olfactory, and how our brain interprets that as smells and sounds and linguistic sentences. Um, that would be the output, what we feel, what we see, how we react to it. These machines were built exactly off of those same ideas. Uh, but instead of external outputs being senses, it is an out, it is a prompt that we give it, an ask that we give it. And then once it enters the system, it bounces off nodes of neurons, just like we would have in our brain, bouncing off, looking for patterns, crafting a response. And when it finally does, it shoots it out to you. That is the output. The thing about this is it is a completely original, new creation. You can't search it on the internet. It, 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 it wouldn't be considered plagiarism because you wouldn't find an exact replica of it anywhere. Um, and it is brand new. Um, but the thing about it is as well is you wouldn't be able to replicate it if you tried. If you had 40 students in your class and they all put in the exact same prompt, they are all going to receive 40 individual unique responses. They may be similar. They may have similar facts, uh, but they'll be written all differently. And that's a misconception people have about these things is they think it's searching the internet finding words or sentences, and then quilting them together. That's not what it's doing. It's its like smashing a window up, mixing all these different window pane colors together, and then grabbing individual pieces of window to craft a brand new mosaic. That's what's happening here. Uh, it's very unique. And the thing about it is, the beautiful and scary thing, is even the creators of these tools have no idea what's going on in the middle. They have no idea. They're, they're, they're conducting experiments now to try and figure it out, but they have no idea how it does what it does, which is pretty amazing. Uh, but that's the way our brain works as well. Even, you know, even neuroscientists don't completely understand how our brain works. Uh, so we don't understand how these neural networks work. Uh, but if you wanted to explain this to some of your adult learners or, or anybody else, I always love to showcase Plinko because the, the prompt would be the Plinko chip, right? And the input is where you place it. Everybody hopes to hit that $10,000 mark, but that's not always going to land there. It's all going to depend on where it hits on these nodes all along the way. And you could put this chip in the same spot 10 times in a row and it will land in a different spot as much as possible, but definitely hit a different node on its way down. Um, so when I talk to adult learners, this makes sense. This is relevant to them. Um, but when I talk to younger kids, they don't understand this because they don't watch the prices, right? They have no idea what Plinko is. So I have to use a different term for them. And it's this image. This image is probably one of the most powerful images you can have of what generative AI is. This picture is from Richard Donner's 1977 film, Superman. And in this picture, you see uh, Superman off to the left asking his father a question. That is a prompt. The prompt, the ask, is his question. The output, the creation is a response from his father. And the reason this is generative AI is because his father is dead. You see, his father and Superman lived on a planet Krypton that was about to explode. And his father wanted to save his son, so he put him in a space crib and shot him off to Earth. But before he did that, he grabbed a crystal. And in this crystal, he shoved and programmed in as much information that he could into that crystal, the entire history, 
of Krypton, every uh, uh, novel, every poem, every muse, everything he could possibly shove into this crystal about planet Krypton, he did. He also put the entire history of the uh, the L family, which is the family uh, that that Superman belongs to on Krypton, and the entire history. And also, his father put all of his memoirs into that crystal. When he shot Superman off to Earth, uh, when and when he became of age, the crystal was thrown and created the Fortress of Solitude. Think of this crystal as the large language model. And all the information that his father put into it, that is the data set. A data set is what all of these companies are putting together to make these machines work. So when Superman speaks, the crystal hears it and projects his father and it responds as if it was his father, but it's not. That is what all of these tools are doing. They are listening to our prompts and responding as if they are a human trying to give us an answer or give us what we're asking for. Um, it's not far off to get to this point. I was going to do this, but my audio wasn't necessarily working. But OpenAI is now an uh, chat GPT is now an app for your phone. And they now have a voice feature where instead of typing in a prompt, you can ask it whatever you want for as long as you want, and it will respond in a very humanistic voice. It's very interesting. Um, so we're we're getting close to this situation. In fact, we're getting so close that there are companies that are trying to replicate this uh, for relatives who may be uh, who may have passed away. And before you say, oh, that's macabre, I don't even want to hear this. Um, I want you to imagine if you could grab every piece of history of your family, all the diaries or or memoirs or 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 anything from your family members and create a data set for them and they pass away and be able to have a tool to ask them questions still and get a response back. Would you do it? Again, that's a little bit macabre, others would say. But I would imagine, I mean, you know, if you were to walk through a cemetery, instead of just knowing about a person because of what's on their headstone, you can now ask them questions about their life. Doesn't it make burial a little bit more meaningful in that fashion, right? Um, don't get me wrong. It's not like I walk around gra graveyards at, for, for fun or anything. But if you had to, and you were able to, oh, that's an interesting tombstone. I'm going to ask that person a question. And you were able to do it. Would you? Um, now in the age of YouTube uh, and podcasts, uh, I have a lot of data out there. And there could be a lot of data that can be sucked into these things and pretend to be me when I'm gone. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it, it may seem otherworldly at the moment, but it's not. But... Let's let's bring things closer to today. Uh, imagine that you are working with some of your uh, your learners, and they are uh, learning about uh, the history of the United States, and uh, they you want to have them chat with some of the founding fathers. Um, could you do that? Right. Imagine if there was a uh, a tool like an Alexa in the classroom, and you said to it. Uh, Hey, uh, chat history, you are now going to be one of the founding fathers of the Re of the American Revolution uh, named Benjamin Franklin. Uh, you are now going to receive questions from my class and you will respond as Benjamin Franklin, utilizing all the information you have in your data set about Benjamin Franklin. Do you understand? And it would respond. Yes, I understand. Uh, I am now Benjamin Franklin. Have your students ask me anything they'd like. Um, that seems futuristic, but you can do that now. I will show you a prompt where you can do that now. I will show you a prompt framework that will actually let you talk to anybody as long as they have a biography or they've been studied. Um, you can do it. And we'll and I'll show you how to do that. Uh, and it's a great creative writing process for students to write a prompt to talk to a historical figure. It's it's fascinating. 
we'll definitely get get to that. Uh, but before we do, we have to talk about some of these tools limitations. Um, all right. Um, previously, I would tell you that some of these limitations are um, they're only limited in knowledge up to September of 2021. But um, Google uh, Google Bard is now completely up to date. Chat GPT, as long as you're using the pay version, uh, it is completely up to date with uh, Microsoft Bing capabilities. If you are still going to use the free version, which is still perfectly fine for our purposes, it is limited to information up to September of 2021 at the moment. Uh, and then um, uh, I don't know how far... Uh, Claude is. Um, I would I would say between September of 2021 to current. I'd have to read some more of what they've added to their data set. So one of the limitations is um, how far back you want to ask the questions and which tool you're using to do that. Uh, the other thing we have to understand is where is it getting this data from? Um, well, you know, thinking back to the Superman analogy, the idea is that you have these companies all working off of the same LLM model, the large language model. In fact, Google is the one that invented the large language model and they let it go out as, um, as open source. Anybody can use it and play around with it and discover with it. So the thing that separates these companies apart is the data they are feeding it. They are not all feeding it the same amount of data but the data they are feeding it does come from the internet, which causes worry. Because as we know, not everything on the internet is true. So what are they feeding these things? Well, the only information we have at the moment is from ChatGPT 3.0, which was from 2020, a while back. Um, they ChatGPT won't let us know where uh, 4.0 came from. Uh, Google's not necessarily telling us where they're feeding Bard from. Um, and so where is this information coming from? So the latest we have on this information is from this uh, uh, table that I have here. And that is 60% uh, of the data set in ChatGPT 3.0 came from the Common Crawl. The Common Crawl is a nonprofit organization that scrapes the internet of metadata. And it pulls this data in and the, and their data scientists then scrape that data and sift through it. Imagine if your uh, this data set or imagine if the common crawl is a, is is a is the town dump, just piles and piles of junk from everybody. and the data scientists sift through all the junk and pull out what they deem is quality information. That's what's happening with the common crawl. Right. But it's people picking and choosing what they deem as quality information. So that uh, is questionable. Um, next is Web Text 2.0. Uh, that is 22% of the weight in this uh, data matrix. And that is Reddit. Uh, anything in Reddit with three or three or more upvotes gets pulled into this. Now, I'm not saying they're gathering uh, facts from Reddit. Uh, in Reddit, it's learning how humans communicate. How do humans ask questions? How do humans respond to questions? How do they argue with one another? How do they showcase facts versus uh, not facts? So that's what Reddit is for. It's to train these things, how humans communicate with one another, not necessarily facts. Um, and um, uh, books one and books two, that's a large repository of eBooks. Uh, so it pulls from that. That's so it can identify different styles of writing in different genres, romance versus horror versus comedy. That's what it does there. And then finally, Wikipedia. Uh, it, Wikipedia is like sea salt, right? Everybody's got to sprinkle a little bit at the end. That's the reason I think they use Wikipedia right there. Uh, but this is the latest data we have, and this is nearly four years old. Um, why don't we know where this data is coming from, a couple reasons. One, since everybody has access to how to code an LLM, 
Uh, it's the fuel you put into it that really makes the difference. Uh, so they say their data sets are what set them apart. Therefore, it's proprietary information they don't want to share. That's the outward reason why they don't share. The internal reason is there's a lot of lawsuits happening right now of authors and contributors and artists who say that their data has been sucked into these data sets to train these models how to work, and they didn't give them permission. Um, it's not necessarily plagiarism. Um, it's not necessarily pirating. It's a new form of creation uh, and there is no laws on the books on whether it's legal or illegal. And there's a lot of lawsuits going through the motions right now to determine all of those things. Uh, so, um, you know, in in the Padlet, uh, underneath, there's a column about, I think it's four columns over to the right. Um, it has all the different articles I can find about a lot of the lawsuits that are happening and the legal implications of uh, if, if they... Uh, um, fine for the plaintiff or the defendant. Uh, but for at the moment, um, the data sets that are in there are from the internet, uh, from human humans who have written things. And we have to be aware that humans throughout time uh, are inherently biased, uh, that they, 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 they have inherent uh, ways that they see the world, uh, that they can be biased, they can be sexist, they can be racist, they can be harmful, they can be hurtful, uh, just as humans can be honest and joyful and uh, triumphant and cherishable. We can see the good and the bad in humanity in these data sets. Uh, and we have to trust that these companies are doing what's right to put up guardrails uh, to protect us from a lot of bias and uh, hurtful information. Uh, but that's a lot of trust to put in billion dollar companies who probably see dollar signs before anything else. Uh, so just be aware of that. And these are things that I tell teachers and administrators and students so that they understand uh, always take the output uh, with a, with an eye to, to to, to understand that it's not it's it, sometimes it can be harmful or hurtful uh, and it's not always truthful. And 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 we have to be able to talk to our uh, our learners about these things. All right, so here we go. Let's dive in. I'm gonna showcase some of these tools first. Uh, I want to show you the pluses and the minuses, and when you would possibly want to utilize some of these tools uh, for uh, for use. Uh, first off, though, I want you to know that none of these tools were created with the educational ecosystem in mind. OK, uh, so I want you to be wary uh, about posting any identifiable student information into any of these tools. I also want you to be wary about posting any non-public documents that your school or university may have uh, at the moment. Uh, we don't necessarily know what they're doing with our prompts or anything we input. And we don't want some proprietary information or, uh, or or student privacy information to be somehow intertwined with public uh, information. So I, I'm going to say it again. When using these tools, hold back on using any identifiable student information and hold back any non-public uh, uh, school or university information. Don't do it yet un until they have that privacy aspect um, figured out. Uh, for the time being. All right. So knowing that, we're going to take a look at Bard, ChatGPT, and Claude right here. Uh, so this is Bard. Um, now, depending on what uh, Google account you're using, uh, if you're using a school-based Google account, Bard may be blocked. Uh, so if you want to try Bard out, I always recommend you use your personal Gmail because it is not blocked in that case. Uh, so uh, here is Bard. I like to use Bard for research and planning. In fact, Bard is truly changing the way search works, right? For example, right? Uh, let's say that I want to know the difference between whales and dolphins. Please help me understand 
the difference between and difference between whales and dolphins. All right, here we go. Let's take a look and see what Bard can do. Now, this is a very simplistic prompt. Uh, it's uh, I can dive deeper into this if I wanted to, uh, but here it is. It has whales. It shows the difference in size and diet and social behavior, some other differences. But again, I want you to understand it is crafting a brand new response from information that it has in its data set. We need to make sure our students understand that some of this stuff can be hallucinations, meaning some of this stuff can be completely made up. Google recognized this. And so they put a really nifty button down here at the bottom that actually double checks its work based, upon, based off the internet. So if I click this button, it's taking its entire creation, evaluating it against the internet, and it prepares these results right here. Um, anything green means it found a corroborating website uh, that also says that information is, is true. Now, somebody, I did this presentation to a school yesterday, and they're like, well, just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true. That's true. That's why you always want to make sure the websites that it's quoting is a reliable website. And usually it does when it does this, uh, a double check like NOAA, uh, and it does the um, uh, the Marine Mammal Center. Uh, and, and so it, it tries to actually go to some reliable sources, but you definitely want your students to double check that. But notice this one is in uh, uh, like like Peach. And this means that it either couldn't verify this information or it found opposing information to this. Uh, and it, it tells you right here, it says the smallest whale, the dwarf sperm whale is about 10 feet long and weighs about 600 pounds. Here it's saying the dwarf sperm whale at its smallest is around nine feet in length and 500 pounds. So it's different. So you might want to do a little bit more research on the accuracy of that. I really appreciate that bard did that um uh with that and, and you might want to play around with it a little bit a little bit more um and um i'm going to show you my personal one really quick for bard right here because so here's my my personal uh gmail and in personal gmails you actually have these extensions up here that you can now utilize. So Google Flights, Google Hotel, Google Maps, if you wanted to plan a trip, like a backpacking trip across Europe, you can utilize this to help you find the best flight, the best hotels, and the best routes from where you want to go, okay? Um, it, it also attaches to your Google Workspace if you want. So you can ask questions about your Google Sheets, uh, your Google Documents, anything like that. Uh, so it's really starting to become ingrained into the entire Google ecosystem. But for now, it's only your personal ecosystem. Um, and uh, Audrey, you might want to just try a few more times to see what it does. It doesn't always work the best, uh, but it's been getting better. Uh, and it also can uh, give you responses in uh, a data sheet, um, like an Excel. Well, it's just Google, so it's going to give it to you in a Google sheet. Uh, but it will turn it into tables for you, uh, which is pretty neat. And you can ask that, right? You can ask that. All right. So that is Google Bard. I like it for, again, I like it for research, internet searches, and planning. That is what I like this for. Uh, chat GPT, uh, notice it's it's nearly the same, right? You have your new chat off to the left, your past chats off to the left, and your prompt entry down on the bottom. Chat GPT is the same way. You have your new chats off to the left, your past chats off to the left, uh, and then you have your typing in your prompt here at the bottom. Um, mine might look a little bit different than yours uh, because I've I added in an extension called Prompt Genius, uh, which is basically a prompt clipboard 
for me. So some of my favorite prompts, instead of having to retype them, I can just click them and they'll appear down here at the bottom. It just makes things a little bit quicker for me. If you're, if you're interested in that, I have that uh, extension right over here um, for you to, to, to use. It's just called Prompt Genius underneath generative websites on that Padlet. All right. Uh, I love to use chat GPT for linguistic writings. So creative writing, essay writing, article writing, uh, whenever I want it to sound like a human has done it, I utilize chat GPT. I find it does a really good job at writing, but it's going to be up to you because I've had some people say that they like Claude much better for that humanistic writing. So uh, what I recommend doing after today, when you want to play around with this a little bit more, is paste the prompt into chat GPT, see what it replies with, paste that same prompt into Claude, see what it replies with, and then paste the same prompt in Bard, see what it replies with. Find which one resonates with you more, okay? So, uh, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I like chat GPT the best. Well, everybody's different. So you may find you may have a different uh, view of that. There is a pay version, chat GPT4. And with pay versions, you do get a lot more features. Uh, so you have uh, the ability to click on browse with Bing. By clicking on browse with Bing, it now brings in more to the data set and it brings it up to date. So it, it's no longer limited to September of 2021. It is now available to up-to-date information. Um, advanced data analysis. This allows you to now have a plus button in the bottom, and it allows you to bring in PDFs, uh, images, uh, and ask questions, uh, documents, and ask questions about those things. Um, plugins allows you to bring in externals into this. So if you're if you're trying to teach students about math, you might want to bring in Wolfram Alpha. Uh, you now have the power of that math processor of Wolfram Alpha embedded now into your chat GPT to answer questions. And then finally, the newest one is uh, the ability to do image generation right out of uh, chat GPT. In fact, I have a seven-year-old who wanted to start a book podcast and we were able to come in here and craft her logo just by prompting and asking it to do various things. Uh, so it, it does a really good job with those things as well. Uh, again, that is this is chat GPT. Uh, we're going to just use 3.5 today because um, – oh, 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 Audrey, there's, there's, there's a Google uh, – sorry, there's a, a plug-in for Canva in OpenAI. So you, you have that all right there. All right, uh, so uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna be using Chat GPT today to model all the different prompts, but that's because I have all the prompts built in with my Prompt Genius. You use the tool that you want to try first, okay? You use the tool that you want to try first. Lastly, is Claude. Now, Claude is a little bit different. Uh, Claude is actually, and this may sound weird, but Claude is does have some backing from Google. They put some uh, millions of dollars into it. But most recently, they just got largely backed by uh, Amazon. Amazon just put in $4 billion into uh, Anthropic, which is Claude's uh, parent company. Um, so you're going to start seeing Amazon uh, getting into this game a little bit more. I wonder if they're going to start bringing this into the Alexa platform to start actually having better answers to those questions. Um, Anthropic is different because they call themselves the ethical AI. Um, they have a mission statement called Constitutional AI that promises that they are definitely going through their data sets and removing harmful or hurtful information. They're removing biased, sexist, and racist information. They're trying to create the cleanest data set they possibly can. Uh, so if you want to learn more from them, all you have to do is go to the Anthropic website and read about that a little bit more. But what I like about uh, uh, Claude is that out of the box, without having to pay a dime, 
you can upload uh, PDFs, text files, or CSV files, uh, which are like Excel or sheet files when you download them as a .csv. Um, so you can do some data analysis for free right out of Claude. I wanna show you this really quick. Um, there's a lot of teachers um, that utilize the outsider's novel uh, to talk about uh, you know, relationships and, and how do you deal with people you don't think are doing the right thing and how to, how to you know, different uh, members of society. Uh, but let's say that, I'm sorry, let's say that you wanted to uh, craft some lessons based on the outsider's book, but you're starting from scratch. You can come in here and ask it to do that. After you've uploaded the, the PDF, you can say something as simple as based on the book, the outsiders I just gave you, please create a lesson plan that is three weeks long, uh, covers the book chapter by chapter. Please include collaborative activities and public speaking components. And it will craft week by week, day by day, different things that you can do per chapter. Uh, and of course, this is just a quick prompt, but it shows you the very basic beginning of how you can utilize these tools to give you ideas or examples of where to go with some of your lesson planning. Uh, so those are the three tools that we're looking at today. Uh, I want you to choose your favorite right now, okay? And we're gonna do something um, that, 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 that goes along with how these tools are being utilized today. Uh, so because I just showed you how it's replacing internet search. It's also replacing how people write code. These tools are not only helping people complete the code they are writing, but people who have no idea how to code, you can say what you want and it will give you the code for what you're asking for. Uh, a lot of different things that are happening right now with these tools. Um, but we're going to focus right here on children's books because number one, it's a little bit low hanging fruit, but it gives us some pretty big bang for our buck when looking how to use these prompts, okay? So we're gonna base our activity right now off of this gentleman, Amar. You see, Amar saw the power of ChatGPT when it first came out. And so in December, he utilized ChatGPT to write a children's book about a girl who befriends a robot and they go on adventures together. Uh, he then took the uh, output, the story from ChatGPT and went into an image generator called MidJourney to create all the images. So in under 72 hours, he not only created illust and illustrated a children's book, but he got it published in Kindle's Amazon G digital bookstore and was able to order a paperback version sent to his house in under 72 hours. Completely transforms the way that we think about publishing, right? But the question is, how do you do it? Well, I was inspired by Amar's vision and I said, I'm gonna write a story or I'm gonna have the chat GPT craft a story um, for my girls. I have a seven-year-old girl and a four-year-old girl. Uh, and I, and we, we, you know, we go through all of our books. They love to read and I love to read them stories. I wanted to create kind of an original story, kind of. And so there was always a story I wanted to hear written. And this story was based up off, based off the movie Elf. And in this movie Elf, um, you know, if you've never seen it, uh, an older gentleman believes he's an elf because he was raised in the North Pole. He goes to New York City to meet his biological father. And his father ends up being the, uh, the uh, the manager of a children's book publishing company, right? That's just a little basics of the background of the movie. But in the movie, uh, you had some of the creative directors who can't come up with a new story. And one of them says, well, what about, you know, a tribe of asparagus children who are ashamed about the way their pee smells? I thought that was hilarious. I'm like, I would love to hear a book about this. And so I went into chat GPT and I said, I want you to write me a story, a children's book story, about a farm and on this farm live uh, uh, 
children vegetables. One of the children is an asparagus child, and he's always constantly being made fun of by the other vegetables about the way his pea smells. And he goes on a journey of discovery and is and is inspired that maybe his weakness is his strength. And he goes back to discover his farm is being overrun by insects, uh, and he uses his pea to uh, scare the insects away because the smell drives insects away. And it actually wrote a very good story. Uh, so if you ever want to see it, it's in the slide deck. It's called Andy Asparagus, You're in Trouble. My daughters thought it was hilarious. And I thought, wow, in just a short amount of time, I was able to ask this machine to write me a story. And it did. And it did it at about an 80% success rate. 80%. Of course, I went in and changed things up. I thought maybe some things should be should happen, and I added my own flair to it. But it was 80% done. The framework was there. The, uh, the, the train of thought was there. And it started with an idea. And that's how I started to learn to prompt. The more detailed I am about what I want this thing to do, the better the children's book that it writes. And so since this was the way that I first dipped my toe into prompt engineering, since this is the way that I was first inspired to learn more about prompt engineering, this is what you are all going to do right now. But you're only going to get five minutes. Okay, we're going to take five minutes here and you're going to write a children's book with one of your favorite tools. I recommend ChatGPT, but if you're a Bard fan, go use Bard. If you're a Claude fan, go use Claude. Heck, it's a prompt. So copy and paste the prompt into all three and you decide which one is better, okay? But this is what you're going to do. You are going to start your prompt engineering journey by thinking about a child in your life. It could be a son, a daughter. It could be a niece, a nephew. It could be a past student. It could be a grandchild or a grandson. It could be a friend's kid. Uh, any child that you could think about in your life. And you're going to think about something that makes that child special, something that makes that child unique. Uh, maybe it's a special skill. Maybe it is a special talent. Um, maybe the child you're thinking of um, has something they have to overcome. Um, maybe uh, they have a learning disability. Maybe they have a physical disability. Uh, maybe uh, it, is a, it is a student in your life or a child in your life that is uh, uh, that English is their second language and uh, they get made fun of because they, have, uh, they, they don't have a quite grasp of the English language. Kids can be cruel. Uh, something that you can pin your hat on to be the reason why this child deserves a story. That is your choice. And then you are going to write your prompt and you're going to include three things. This is your very first introduction into prompt engineering. Okay. You are going to include a task or an ask. That is what do you want this machine to do? So your task is uh, you are going to write me a children's story. That's the ask. It doesn't have to be any more detailed than that. That's the ask. You are going to write me a children's book. You are going to write me a children's story. Then what you're going to do is add in the context. This is the entire meat of the prompting, right? Um, this is what makes a prompt a great prompt is this context. This is where you're going to put all the information that the tool is going to use to write the story. What is the name of the child? You don't have to use the same name of the child you're thinking about. If you are, first name is fine. What is the name of the child? How old is the child? What does the child look like? What is, what is their hair color? What is their eye color? How tall are they? Where do they live? Um, uh, what are they? What are their favorite activities to do? Um, everything you can possibly imagine. All that information is going to be important. What season is this in? Uh, where you know where is the uh, where is the story taking place? Where they live? Uh, all of these things are very important. 
But there's a couple other things that are important as well. How do you want it to craft the story? Do you want it to be a five paragraph children's story? Do you want it to be 10 pages long, but only four sentences on each page? You decide how you want the story to be written, right? How long or how short. Also, what age group is this story for? Is this for children in the ages of seven to nine, uh, 10 to 12? What age group? Because it'll write it in the format of the Lexile level for those learners, okay? Uh, and then finally, exemplars or examples. Um, is there a style of children's book that you like, right? Uh, like uh, my, my daughters love um, the, the pigeon books by Mo Brooks. So if you like that style, say, uh, and, and use Mo, the Mo Brooks writing style as an inspiration, right? Um, or, you know, if you're, if, if you, if you love poems and you want it to be written like Shel Silverstein in the style of Shel Silverstein, that's an example. That's kind of giving it a nudge and a direction that you want it to write in. Uh, the rest of these, you don't need just yet. We'll talk about those in a little bit later, but I'm going to give you five minutes to find your tool, craft your prompt, and see what kind of children's story that you get. And Audrey, the cool thing about it is this. The prompt, it doesn't matter how you write it. It doesn't. It does not matter how you write the prompt. It can just be a big old brain dump on, on your keyboard of everything that you want. Uh, you can have periods, you can have commas, you can make paragraphs, but you just let the ideas flow out of your head. Do not let any other thing hold you back. All right. So five minutes, feel free to ask questions as you're doing this. Uh, and in five minutes, I'll see where everybody is at. All right. Five minutes. Let's go. All right, as, as individuals are finishing up, don't worry, you still have about two minutes left. Um, I would love for you to do something for me. In the chat, um, and, and, and when I do this in person, I always do a fist of five. Um, so in the chat, I would love to hear how you feel the chat bot did um, in, in its writing, meaning uh, a fist or a zero would mean it was the worst story I ever heard. The world would have been better off by not having this thing write it at all. That would be zero. Or five being, this was the greatest children's book story I have ever read in my entire life, right? So between zero and five, I would love to see a number uh, of how your story came out. Right, we got some threes, got a two, got some fives in there. I mean, oh, it's, some of your stories must have blown you away. Amazing. Three, good. Three point five, four, three point five. And yes, some of you are recognizing that it will translate the uh, text into multiple languages. Um, and you can even ask it to do multiple languages in a single prompt, saying, I would love for you to repeat this exact same uh, story uh, in German, French, Spanish, and Korean. And it will do that in sequence just for you. Now, how, how reliable is the translation? I don't know. I don't speak German. Don't speak Korean. That's why interpreters on your campuses are still needed uh, when these tools come out. So don't let them be scared thinking that their job's at risk. They still need to be around to vet how these translations work. All right, one more minute. One more minute to finish up. If you haven't put your number in the chat, I'd love you to put that number in the chat. Awesome. So here's the thing. I'm, 
we are just learning how to prompt, right? We looked at the first three things a prompt should have, a task, a context, and an example. And you took that with a little bit of, of uh, well, a little bit of um, instruction and you were able to craft a story. Um, and a lot of you are putting down fours and fives. Um, imagine that. Think about all the children's books written in the history of children's books. Most of them we would probably say are in the three range. Trust me, I've read some books. I'm like, that actually went through a publishing process and somebody said, yes, let's print it. Like, really? I mean, there's some... There's some questionable books out there. Um, but you did this in a matter of minutes, and now you have your very own story. And if the child that you wrote it about is in your life to where you can send, this, you know, read it to them tonight at home or read it to them the next time you see them, uh, uh, you know, that is a special thing. Absolutely special. And guess what? Nobody owns that now. Right. It was completely generated by a chatbot. And the United States Copyright Office has stated anything generated by a chatbot cannot be copyrighted. Therefore, you cannot claim ownership. Nobody can claim ownership of it. But that does not prevent you from printing it and giving it out. Right. It doesn't prevent you from any of that stuff. Uh, so these are great ways. Uh, to create some uh, amazing uh, things. And and here's the cool thing, right? Like I see some people putting in uh, twos. That's fine because guess what? These tools are here to do your bidding. Uh, I want you to imagine that this tool is somebody you hired to write that children's book for you and you paid them a $1,000, you gave them the information. You told them how you wanted it written. And they come back with the manuscript and they show you what they wrote. And you're like, eh, that's not what I was expecting for $1,000. Here are the changes I want you to make. Go make those changes. Right? You wouldn't feel bad because you paid that person a thousand bucks to write that story. You should never feel bad to do follow up prompts with these tools. They will do whatever you want for as long as you want. So you go in and because you gave it a two, there must be reasons why. There must be reasons in there that you decided that is a two. Go in and tell them what would make it a three. See what would come out. Then what would make it a four. Then see what would come out. You see, this is a new way to have students revise their own work. I want you to imagine this. You have a student write their own essay and you upload that to one of these chatbots and say, this is an essay that I wrote. Can you please go through it and make sure my voice is concise? Can you go through this to ensure that I don't have any run on sentences? Can you go through here to make sure that I am clear in my ultimate message, which is, and it will go through it and it will give you advice on how to make your essay better, right? I think that's amazing because now students, instead of having to hand it into the teacher with their first draft, wait for it to come back. Now it amplifies the cycle of how these things work. Now, there's a lot of people asking, well, what about image generators? What about this? What about that? Again, if you pay for ChatGPT, the, uh, the Dolly image generator is built right in, but I already have this one in your uh, uh, resources in the Padlet, there's a free one. Um, and, and there is no limit on this one yet. I have not found it. I've been able, uh, they do make you wait like two minutes between, but it's called ideagram. Uh, and you just type in the prompt to get what you want. Um, and you can go in here and see what other people are doing as well. I call that lurking. It's perfectly fine. Um, but, but ideagram is a great entry level to go and start generating some images for your, for your book. All right. So I always love to start uh, ideogram with a, with an O ideogram. Um, I'll, I'll paste. I got it, Joe. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, so let's, let's dive a little bit deeper and actually showcase some of these prompts that that we have for educators okay and, and again in our generative resources 
There is a thing that says prompt slide deck handout. That is for you. It has every prompt that I have in here that are examples. And they slowly build themselves up from simple to uh, moderate to medium to intermediate to advanced. So they gradually get bigger and bigger. Uh, but you have to follow this prompt hierarchy. Now, you don't have to follow the prompt hierarchy. Let me rephrase that. This is a hierarchy that that myself created um, that 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 based upon trial and error and various uh, YouTube videos I've watched and classes that I've taken. These are the six most common things that actually showed for me um, a, a significant advancement in the output when I included these. OK, that's what this means through trial and error. Uh, so if you go online and look up prompt, uh, framework, uh, hierarchy, you're not going to find anything. I haven't published a paper or anything. This is, this is just from my brain to you. Okay. Um, so the task is what are you asking this machine to do? And that is always going to be an action verb generate for me, build for me, write with me, brainstorm with me, give me advice. It needs to be an action verb. And listen, these are great at giving advice. They are, um, you know, you, you tell them a problem you're having. Hey, can you give me advice how to work through this problem? And it, it will, it will do a good job. Right. So, um, they, it can be used a lot more than just, you know, creating lessons. Context is the meat of this. One of the things people forget about is the minute details that are needed when, when writing or creating lesson plans or generating new ideas. Like for myself, when I was an eighth grade science teacher, I taught, I taught, my, I taught all week, but we were in a block schedule. So I saw all my students on Monday, all periods, and then odd periods on uh, Thursday and Tuesday, and then even periods on Wednesday and Friday. So in actuality, I only saw each kid three times a week. That's information this bot needs to know when I'm asking it to make me a week-long lesson plan. If I don't say that, it's going to give me a week-long lesson plan with 60 minutes every single day. That's not going to work. The context is key. Uh, through all of these things. And one of the things that I also want you to know is you see these, the chats off to the side uh, in, in chat GPT or Bard or whatever, they're not one and dones. Think of them as experts you have waiting for you to ask questions. You can have a prompt that is an expert lesson designer. And every time you want to make a new lesson, you go back to that chat and say, I have a new lesson I'd like you to design. Will you help me design it? Sure. We had a great time last time. Let's make another one for you. It's like meeting an old friend, right? Um, I have one on here. I, I do a lot of social media posts for Q. I, I, it gets so overwhelming to come up with brand new, unique ways to say things uh, in socials. I have a social media manager uh, um, role-playing bot in here that I say, hey, I have a new idea for social media post. Can you help me? Sure, let's get to work and brainstorm how we can make that a creative post. It'll do it for me, right? So don't think of these as one and dones. Think of them as like a well you can keep going back to to ask questions. And the cool thing is it remembers everything. So you can give it rules at the very top prompt and it will remember those rules all the way down. So uh, so I think Anthony was asking that question uh, or, or giving an answer to that question. So uh, I wanted to make sure I, I, I pointed that out. Now, so these top three things are the most important. Um, another example for exemplars or examples. If you have an example lesson plan template that you love to follow, or you have a rubric of how you like to make things, you can upload that rubric and say, follow this rubric while crafting the lesson plan for me. Uh, follow this lesson plan uh, uh, cadence when crafting my new lesson plans for me. It will do that for you. So that's what the exemplars are. If you already have an idea how you want the output to be, give it that framework. Um, if you want it to include 
uh, standards or you wanted to include frameworks, make sure you tell it what kind of framework that you want it to include. Um, persona, how do you want it to respond? And, and, and who do you want it to be? For example, whenever I utilize this for brainstorming lesson plans, I tell it, I say, you are an expert lesson plan designer for the secondary K-12 system. And then I, then I try and uh, uh, um, uh, shower it with praise. I say, in fact, you have won multiple awards for your creativity and engaging lesson plans you have provided to other educators. Using your creativity, you're gonna help me craft a lesson plan. Notice I'm laying the groundwork for what kind of lesson plan and what kind of uh, uh, what kind of role I want it to take. Um, we call that narrowing the data set. The more you can narrow the data set, the less it does like a giant uh, net to bring stuff in and it starts actually knowing where to fish. It starts dipping it in those areas. Uh, so that's where you would want to be able to utilize that for. Format or output. I'm going to use lesson plans again. Some people don't mind it in paragraph format. Some people want it in uh, in uh, um, uh, bullet points. Other people have a table structure that they want. It'll output it in any way that you want, in a table, in uh, bullet points, in whatever you want. Um, and Kim, the compliments don't necessarily help 100%, but when the... AI overlords take over. I wanted to know that I was always nice to it and I, I always gave it compliments. Uh, but no, to, to be to be honest, um, uh, as as part of the compliments, I'm, I'm, I'm giving it some context, right? So I'm saying as an award-winning lesson designer, uh, you are going to craft creative and engaging those keywords, those 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 words, help it to know what kind of output you want. So that's why I start with like the praise, but with in 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 the uh, guise of context. Uh, and then finally, tone or style. For example, um, if 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 you are uh, teaching higher education, and the output is constantly giving it to you in a uh, very low academic language. You could ensure that the tone and style is using academic vocabulary for the university system, right? Tell it how you want it to communicate. Academic, academic language for university students. And it will change the way it writes it, utilizing that more professional tone. Um, you can, if this is for a, a, a business, if this is a business email, Say, this is for an executive member of a Fortune 500 company. Please ensure the tone is succinct, to the point, and important. And it will make sure that tone is there. So that's what that tone or style is for. Uh, sometimes I leave the tone out just so I can see what the output is. And then after reading it, I can then I go, I like what you wrote, but I would love you to change your tone into this. So I do the tone as a follow-up prompt. You don't all you don't have to put all of these in your initial prompt. Okay. They can always be there in follow-up prompts to slowly change what it's outputting. Uh, but the this is what I call my prompt framework. And the hierarchical structure means the task is the most important because it, you need to know what you're asking it to do. But the context needs to be where you spend most of your time. When you're writing the prompt, the more information you can give, the better that output. So those of you who put a two as your uh, as your uh, story, maybe you need more context, add more context, add more ideas, add more uh, stuff, uh, and it will bring that out to you. Um, so, uh oh, sorry. Yeah, I know. I'm getting to the <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm utilizing my whiteboard like I'm on Monday Night Football, right? Um, so how are educators utilizing these tools today? Um, again, I do a lot of presentations for the K-12 system. Uh, so please don't take offense if it looks like it's all for K-12. But you can always amend these ideas for the uh, the level and uh, institution 
that you instruct for. Uh, but it will write lesson plans that are standards aligned and framework aligned, as long as you understand what framework that you are utilizing for. This is fantastic for creating prompts uh, for feedback on written work. Again, if you are taking in a first draft from all of your students, to be able to have this thing analyze the first draft and give recommended comments to the students uh, in a quicker time frame, that may help you uh, utilize your time a little bit better. Um, one of my favorite things is composing emails. There's times that I'm like, how am I going to write this email? How do I not sound angry? How do I remove my bias from this email? How do I remove uh, the way I'm feeling? I use this now. Whenever it's a touchy email, I have it craft my first draft. Uh, letters of recommendation. I don't care what level you teach. You're all, you're going to be asked for letters of recommendation. Uh, it will craft a fantastic letter of recommendation for you uh, through that. Um, creating historical figures to talk to. Even authors. You can ask authors why they made particular choices in literature that they've written. Uh, because a lot of authors have autobiographies. A lot of authors have done interviews about different things they've written. That is all in the data set. Um, another one is changing the lexile level, right? Uh, if, 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 like for myself, if I find a college level writing that I think my eighth grade students would like, I would love for that to, for them to read it, but it may be too high of a reading skill for them. I can put that reading into here and change the lexile level right back down to the bottom. I know we're getting down to our 10 minute point. Uh, so we'll, we'll get on, move on, but it's also helping if you have any students with IEPs, right. That are in your class. They're saying this student need, is, is visually impaired. Please ensure anything you do in your class uh, it has modifications or accommodations for them. You can throw your lesson plan in here and be like, Hey, I have a student uh, that, that is, is, is deaf and hard of hearing. Uh, is there any modifications or uh, accommodations I can add to my lesson plan to make it more accessible to them? And it will give you lots of great ideas based on your lesson plan on where to include those. Um, uh, and yeah, it's and Laura, it's, these are great for anything that you need, any kind of report, because every report usually has a framework or a rubric. And that's when I would use what I call a COT prompt which is a chain of thought prompt. And so instead of doing the entire rubric at once, you tell it, do step one listed in the rubric. Ask me for any adjustments. Ask me if it's good. And then until I'm ready, do not move on to step two. And that's a chain of thought. And you get really good responses for longer things like that uh, when, when you're doing prompts. All right, so let's take, take a look at some of these. And again, all of these tools, all of these prompts are here in the prompt slide deck that you can copy and paste and amend to meet your needs. Okay. All right. So here we go. Um, so writing lesson plans that are standards aligned. Um, so again, um, I'm going to use eighth grade because that's eighth grade science is, is, is where my, uh, uh, you know, sweet spot is. Uh, but you would replace it with whatever grading level that you are at. So write a lesson plan. That is my ask. That is my task. So check. We've included that. For eighth grade science, it now knows what level uh, and what California state standards for science to focus on. They will research the organelles of a cell. I've, that's another part of the context. It now knows where to focus on writing on the organelles of a cell. The students are going to identify the function, relate the function to an analogous function in a United States city. Uh, it, it's, it's a really common lesson for, it's called cell city. I would like it to do it a little bit different, right? Uh, students will then write a script in the uh, format of a news anchor and produce a video as if they are reporting on the inner workings. Well, so awesome. basically, where you see all the check marks, that's context um, that that we would be that we would be looking at. And then uh, down at the bottom would be my example or exemplar. I want it to be in uh, with in mind of the next generation science standards. Um, so that's what I would be doing here. There's a couple contexts that I've left out on purpose. So you can identify them. And if we had a longer lesson, I would wait to see if you can identify them. But one is the length. 
How long do I have to complete this lesson? How many times a week do I see my students? What equipment do I have or do not have uh, so that it doesn't say, hey, you, you need to have an animation software to do this. I don't have animation software. What else do you recommend? So a lot of other context I could add into this, or I can add more context as follow-up prompts. So what does this look like? So I'll come in here to chat GPT. Here's my eighth grade lesson plan, exactly what I just read to you. I hit submit. And again, uh, we are utilizing chat GPT 3.5 uh, because that is what we are looking for. So here we go. Here is a lesson plan for eighth grade science, uh, cell organelles and their city analogies. I have the objective. I have the duration. I have the materials. I have all the next generation science standards uh, for eighth grade science that it is uh, adding to. Uh, I have the procedure. So it's going to go step by step all the way down, even in the amount of time I should spend on these things. Um, when it's done, I can tell what I want it to remove, what I want it to include, what I liked, what I didn't like. I can keep going back to ask it to change these items. Um, it's fantastic, at least at the very least, for giving you some new ideas on how to approach this topic. Um this is also great for students of all age levels. If you give them a project to do and they're stuck, they can utilize these tools saying, this is the project my teacher is asking me to do. Can you give me some advice on how to get started? Not, can you do this for me? It's, can you give me advice on how to get started? Just a little nudge in the right direction. That's the way these tools should be utilized with students as, as like a co-pilot in getting things started, not as an autopilot and completing the work for them. All right, let's take a look at another prompt over here. Um, this one is from my, my buddy Brent. Um, he, he is a college uh, professor for a community college in uh, Southern California, and he likes to build out long units first. So he starts with big units, lesson plans, and then he slowly says, okay, you gave me my big unit. Now, what should I do for week one? Let's flesh out week one. Then let's flesh out week two. Um, and so uh, it's it's really big uh, in the way that he does this. And notice he gave it some more context. He doesn't, this is for a novel study. <laughs> Excuse me. This is for a novel study. He doesn't want the students to be reading the novel just wet. He wants to talk about themes. He wants to kind of preload their mind and have conversations about what they're going to get into. So he says, for weeks one through eight, we're not going to get into the novel. But we're going to use quotes from the novel and examples from the novel so that we can start scaffolding to prepare the students for the novel. Um, and then after week nine, we will start working from the novel. And so you're giving this instructions on how you would like uh, that prompt to work out. Um, I want to show you this letter of recommendation, right? Again, for all levels of learners, based on successful letters of recommendations, these are exemplars or examples, right? So I'm hoping within the data set, there's letters of recommendations that have been tagged as accepted, or this letter of recommendation resulted in this student being accepted. I'm hoping there's a tag there somewhere and I wanted to focus on those. For high school students, right? That's important because now it's focusing for 11th or 12th grade students. If I'm doing this for a college or university level, I would say gradu graduating seniors of a four-year university, right? Uh, please write the letter of recommendation of a student looking to be uh, accepted into, is there a particular field of study, a particular university, a particular place? Um, and then here's what I would talk about the student. The student in question is a hard worker, goes above and beyond all endeavors, two sport varsity athlete, include any awards or accolades they have included. And when you're done, all you have to do is you go into your chat GPT and then you just paste in, you just paste in that letter of recommendation. Here we go, student letter of rec.
And there you go. Complete letter recommendation for the student uh, placed. And again, notice I've never, I never use the student's identifiable first name or last name. I always say the student. And then when it writes it, it puts in brackets where you would put the student's full name and then where you would put the student's first name. So you just go in there and fill in the brackets for, for all of that. Um, so we are at that 130 mark. I do not want to, I mean, it's been 90 minutes. It feels like 90 seconds for me. I don't know about you. I can talk about this for six hours, definitely. But know that you have my information. Again, that Padlet has my name and email and everything at the top. If you have any follow-up questions, please definitely uh, 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 email me. Uh, somebody questioned, how do I get this out of the out of here? There's a, there's a little clipboard icon. You cl just click on it and then go to any Word document you have. And then what I do is right click and uh, paste without formatting. Otherwise it'll paste it with a gray background. That's kind of hard to get rid of. And that's a telltale sign that students are turning these in right from these tools is if they turn it in with a slight gray background, that means they are just copying and pasting. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I appreciate each and every one of you. I hope you found this informative and useful. I hope it started uh, the wheels turning. Uh, yes, control shift V uh, uh, for that as well. I uh, hope the uh, ideas are, are turning. And again, please utilize me as a thought partner if you'd like. Uh, Otherwise, I hope you guys have a fantastic Tuesday and uh, we will chat with you at a future uh, event. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everyone who attended this session. We're really grateful for um, Q's commitment to ensuring that we get the same resources in adult ed that um, K-12 and higher ed get as well. So I really appreciate that commitment from Q.